Okay. Uh, just a few more in the waiting room and then we'll start. Okay, everyone. Well, welcome to the eighth episode of Digging In Season 2. I'm Lindsay Randall, the host of the speaker series. And Digging In is a series of live presentations with archaeologists from around the country, co-sponsored by the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology and the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. Join us every other Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time through June for our presentations. For a schedule of dates and presenters, please visit us at pbd.andover.edu or at the Massachusetts Archaeological Society's Facebook page. And if you enjoy our programming, consider expanding your impact by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. We are able to bring you outstanding programming through support of viewers like you. Today, we are very excited to welcome Dr. Kair Singleton. Uh, Kiera Singleton is the Executive Director of the Royal House and Slave Quarters Museum. She is also a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, in the Department of American Culture. Currently, she is on dissertation completion fellowship in the History Department at Harvard University. And before joining the History Department as a dissertation fellow, she held prestigious academic fellowships from the Benecke Foundation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, Emory University's James Weldon Johnson Institute for the Study of Race and Difference, and the American Association of University Women. From 2018 through 2019, she served as the Humanity in Action Policy Fellow for the ACLU of Georgia, where she worked on various issues, including mass incarceration, reproductive justice, and voting rights. And as a public history scholar, Kira Singleton currently serves as an advisor on the Boston Arts Commission, Commission's Recontextualization Subcommittee for the Bronze Emancipation Group Statute. She also is a member of the Board of Public Humanities Fellows at Brown University, which brings together a collection of museum leaders from Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. Um, and remember, at the conclusion of the talk, viewers are able to submit questions directly to me via the chat function, either at the bottom of your screen or at the side of your Zoom screen. And then we will give our speaker time to answer as many as she can with the understanding we might not get to all of them. So welcome, Kiera. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to be here with you all today and to speak about um, the work that we're doing over at the Royal House um, in Slave Quarters. And I am just going to um, get the presentation started by sharing um, my uh, PowerPoint and then we'll, I'll just launch into the talk. All right, um, so uh, again, my name is Kiara Singleton. Um, I am not quite a doctor yet, though. Um, whenever anyone calls me a doctor, it feels like an extra push and gives me a little bit um, uh, of hope that I am close to the finish line. Uh, so, <laughs> so thank you for that, Lindsay. Um, Today, uh, I'm gonna talk to you all about what goes into telling a complex story about the history of slavery in New England through talking about the work that we do at our site, the Royal House and Slave Quarters. Um, so I'm not sure if many of you have had a chance to uh, visit the museum or if you know anything about us. So I'll, I'll give um, a brief overview during the course of the talk, but one of the things that I really want um, to highlight today as well is because I happen to be doing this this talk at the start of um, uh, Preservation History Month, right? And so uh, one of the things, uh, I think the uh, theme for this year is to tell a full American story. And I think our site does a really good job at doing that and contending with the complexities of what goes into preserving historic sites while at the same time thinking about how do you tell um, stories that are often painful, uh, to tell stories that um, are often, um, I think, hard for uh, people to think through when it comes to the history of slavery and centering the lives of the enslaved people. Um, that so many historic sites throughout, not only throughout New England, but throughout the country uh, have to contend with on a daily basis.
so um, this is a, a, a shot of our museum. Um, as you can see, um, you have this grand mansion um, to, my, to my left, and then behind it, you have um, the slave quarters. Now, um, what's really, really important about our site is that we have um, the only known standing uh, slave quarters in New England. Now, uh, I wanna contextualize that just a bit because there are a lot of sites that have a history um, uh, connected to enslavement, but we have the only known freestanding slave quarters. And when I say freestanding, that is really important because these uh, slave quarters were used for the, for the sole purpose of housing um, enslaved people, as well as uh, for the labor that uh, enslaved people did on our site. Now, the mansion is also slave quarters, right? Enslaved people live there as well. Um, and so many historic sites do have slave quarters when you consider kind of the main homes um, as the site of enslavement. So I just wanted to contextualize that um, just a bit. So my first introduction to the Royal House and Slave Quarters was in the summer of 2019. I happened to be in town for an academic conference in which we were all encouraged to take a tour of the Royal House and Slave Quarters by Dr. Kendra Field, who is the co-director of the African American Trail Project at Tufts University. As a scholar who is deeply invested in the history of slavery, and as someone who grew up in New Jersey, I was simultaneously shocked and intrigued to learn that there remained sla standing slave quarters in the North. I immediately pulled out my phone to Google the site, and the description read as follows. In the 18th century, the Royal House and Slave Quarters was home to the largest slaveholding family in Massachusetts and the enslaved Africans who made their lavish way of life possible. Today, the Royal House and Slave Quarters is a museum whose architecture, household items, archaeological artifacts, and programs bear witness to intertwined stories of wealth and bondage set against the backdrop of America's quest for independence. So um, I immediately uh, gathered a group of my friends and <laughs> we went on a tour uh, for the, to the Royal House and Slave Quarters. And in many ways, um, my shock, uh, my initial shock at there being freestanding uh, slave quarters in the North quickly turned into um, a deep admiration for how careful um, the site dealt um, with the history of slavery and how um, important it was to center enslaved people in the telling of the story. So I'm going to begin um, my talk uh, with a poem that I like to start with. It's called On Sullivan's I um, Island and it's a poem by Georgia author of the year and Kaveh Kanem poet Malcolm Tariq. He writes, I heed a path trotted for me before. I am this impaired forgetting and forgetting and forgetting. What else is this wave crashing into shore but an attempt to cleave remembrance? Overhead, the dark sky engulfs the low country, once welcomed spot and terror for the ancestors, always a nest for the captors. Now, baby strollers and casual dog walks file before a single marquee meant to hold place for history. Leisure where once labor. What work have I come here to do besides witness? I go from shore to shore seeking clarity to stand on the threshold of past and present where land and sea court death. I search my mind for what remains of generational sanity. There is nothing but bondage. So I really wanted to start with that poem because I think when we think about the legacy of slavery in the North, I wanna begin with um, thinking about the violence of forgetting, of not seeing. The legacy of slavery is all around us. It manifests in our very built environments, the land we walk, the monuments on display, the institutions we teach in, and for me, quite literally in the museum I lead. Although slavery existed in Massachusetts and in the North more generally, we often celebrate and talk about the North's legacy of abolitionism, while, and, and, and in particular, white abolitionism. Yet slavery was an important part of Northern society, 
Scholar Wendy Warren estimates that by the 1670s, more than half of the ships in Boston's harbor were going to and from the West Indies. This is important because I think people look at the region as a whole and say, well, there weren't as many enslaved people um, here, but numbers obscure the truth. Scholars such as Jared Hardesty, Hardesty shows that while enslaved people made up 4% of New England's population, in the 18th century, when you look at places such as Boston, that number actually fluctuates between 12 and 15%. And if you were to go to neighboring Rhode Island, that number jumps to 25%. So slavery was important to New England's economy. You have in the 19th century, um, it's important to acknowledge uh, the indigenous uh, populations who were here before colonists came and colonized. And so you have in the 17th century um, colonists coming um, and enslaving and stealing land from indigenous people throughout the region and actually using that land to cultivate um, to cultivate food and to supply timber and other goods that were necessary um, to help sugarcane plantations function in the West Indies. You even have people like John Winthrop, who sent his sons to start plantations in Barbados. So it's really important that, you know, as we're talking about the museum and going to get into um, archaeology, you know, to think about how land was actually used, um, to think about what was on um, the site before um, uh, the Royal House and Slave Quarters came into being. Uh, so I mentioned John, um, John Winthrop, uh, who sent his sons over to start uh, plantations in Barbados. Uh, it's important because in many ways, uh, that's how we kind of get to our museum, the Royal House and Slave Quarters. So Ten Hills Farm, um, which, which was the land that the Royal House and Slave Quarters used to sit on, was, 500, was a 500 acre estate. And Isaac Royal Jr. purchased it in 1732. Um, and it was previously owned by John Winthrop. Um, in 1737, Isaac Royal Jr. returned to his senior returned to his native New England after amassing a fortune um, on the Caribbean island of Antigua. Um, in his two decades in Antigua, he had sold about 274 enslaved people. So for nearly four decades, um, the family's lavish lifestyles and the operations of their working farm depended on enslaved Africans, um, some of whom came over with the family from Antigua. More than 60 men, women, and children were held in bondage on the property between 1737 and the start of the American Revolution. So, that's just like a quick kind of overview of the background history to how we get uh, to the Royal House and Slave Quarters. And I wanna now talk about how we do the work that we do at the Royal House and Slave Quarters. So when, you, when most people have heard about the Royal House and Slave Quarters, they have heard about the history and connection to um, the American Revolution. I mentioned that it is um, National um, Preservation um, uh, Month and National Historic Preservation Month. And one of the reasons why I think it is important to think about that is kind of thinking about the reasons why sites like um, the Royal House and Slave Quarters are preserved. It is, they were not preserved to talk about the history of slavery. Um, in many ways, they were preserved to talk about American patriotism, um, to display, uh, you know, the fancy architecture, to talk about um, the men and women who were enslavers, but to talk about their societal connections. Uh, and so when you think of, so when we get to our site, the royal family, uh, they were very, very well known because they're prominent members of society. Isaac Royal Jr. sits on the governor's council. Many of you probably know that when he passes away, he bequeaths a certain amount of money that is then used to help fund the law school and establish the royal professor, um, professorship of law, uh, of the royal chair of professorship at Harvard Law School. So it's really important when we think about all of these connections that we're doing a lot of work when we say that it is important to center um, the lives of enslaved people because it's so easy, right, to not center them and to focus on the people who um, were enslavers versus the people who helped build the wealth. 
So, and one of the one of the ways that we try to decenter the royal family at our site is literally through archival documents. So right now, I just have up an um, an image of an inventory that was done of Isaac Royal's property um, in the 1730s, and it lists a lot of the furniture that the family owned, as well as um, enslaved people. So you have um, a Negro man named Fortune there. Uh, you have another um listing of uh, four other enslaved people and then if you were you know this is not the you know old historical documents are not always the the clearest but if you were to look um if we were to have a closer up image you have cups and chairs and other items listed on the inventory and so when we think about how the story was originally told of the royal house and slave quarters you know people often talked about all of the possessions that the family had but if you look at the document right next to the possessions right next to the objects and artifacts are enslaved people and it's important that we talk about um enslaved people and center their history so when you first come into the museum, one of my favorite panels that hang um, that hangs on the wall is this one that says enslaved on the royal estate. And it lists the names of the 60 some women, men and children that we know were once enslaved by the royal. Um, family. Now we might not have um, a ton of information on every single person, but we feel it is our duty to list the information that we do know. And if it's a name, we list the name. If we have more information um, on different individuals, then that is also um, a part of the story. But for many people um, that we know about who were enslaved on this on, on the royal estate, we only have a first name, uh, except for Belinda Sutton, who I'll talk about a little bit later. So now I'm gonna take you into a few spaces of the museum. Uh, right now you are looking at the winter kitchen and inside of the winter kitchen, uh, which you see stage, you have milk pans, you have uh, candlesticks in the back. Uh, if you look to the, in the corner, um, that's kind of adjacent to the chair, we have a ton of uh, burlap uh, sacks and those are to represent the uh, enslaved people who we know were on the inventory as enlisted as sleeping um, in the kitchen. So we know that there are Negro beds and bedding in the kitchen because that is what is on the inventory. And so, you know, you, you come into the kitchen and you look and you see in the background uh, all of that pewter, which is a uh, indication of the wealth that the royal family had. But then you're also confronted with the fact that you are in a space of labor. You're in a space of compelled labor. That enslaved people are not only sleeping in this uh, kitchen, but they're also, imagine, working around the clock um, to make sure that food is getting prepared for the, the royal family. Family, to make sure that um, you know candles are 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 being made, to make sure that um, milk is getting uh, churned, that cream is getting skimmed. These are all a part of kind of their daily their daily activities. And the reason why uh, we have uh, these milk pans and um, different artifacts uh, staged throughout the kitchen is because this is what we know, we're, we know that this was in the kitchen based on the, um, the inventories. So another space that I'm going to take you in into the museum is uh, the kitchen chamber. And this room is right above the kitchen, which is why it's named the kitchen chamber. And the inventory tells us that this, this room was used for a bunch of different um, uh, uses. We know that uh, enslaved people uh, slept in this room because on the inventory it lists uh, two Negro beds and bedding. Uh, we also know that the room was used for storage because there were trunks that were listed on the inventory. We know um, that enslaved women most likely used this as a workspace to mend and make clothing because uh, the inventory listed that 
that this room had different fabric as well as uh, different trunks. Um, so we know that this, this space was used for many different uh, purposes. One of the other interesting things um, about this room is that we know that it most likely also was a, a dressing room. And the reason why we know that is because the inventory tells us that there's a looking glass. And so most likely what would happen is before a big party, Isaac Royal Jr., who threw a lot of lavish parties, um, would come in here, uh, get dressed, have someone put on his, have an enslaved uh, person put on his powdered wig before he would go out and entertain. And one of the things that I want to highlight, I think, about this space as well is that you can see how bare the walls are. And I want you to remember that um, when I talk a little bit about the, uh, the marble chamber. So this talk is for uh, archaeology. So I really uh, want to spend a lot of time to talk about the archaeological findings as well that are on our site. Um, in 19, between 1999 and 2001, uh, led by Dr. Alexander Chan uh, at Boston University, we underwent a archaeological dig. And during this dig, we uncovered about 55,000 uh, pieces of artifacts that have led to the reinterpretation of the museum. So um, a few of these artifacts we use to really talk and highlight uh, interiority, leisure, and resistance. So one of the things that we do not want to do at the museum is we don't want people to come and only learn about the labor that enslaved people did. Uh, that is really important, but one of the things we want to make sure we do is to not make violence um, necessarily like the cornerstone of enslaved people's history necessarily. That as violent as uh, enslavement is, we wanna also make sure that people understand that enslaved people were resisting on a daily basis and they were resisting in both large and smaller ways. Um, and so one of the ways that we often talk about is the use of um, game pieces and um, marbles in order for enslaved families um, to participate in, uh, in leisure. So on my right, what you see are uh, game pieces and uh, marbles. So we know that these uh, uh, tiles were fashioned into game pieces by enslaved people on site. And then marbles were also found as well. And so we believe that these were used to um, play games that enslaved families would gather um, at points during the day uh, to spend time with their, their family, to spend time with the other enslaved people um, who were held on our site in order to, um, you know, create moments of uh, downtime for themselves. Now, it's really important that we talk about uh, these game pieces and these marbles because they were found um, during the archaeological dig directly in front of the slave quarters. And what's important about that is that they were found outside in a yard that was not actually um, in view from the main house. So we can have a whole conversation about how enslaved people found time for their for privacy and how they made um, moments for themselves and how they probably stole moments away from the labor that they were compelled to do on a daily basis. And I want to also be careful to not make it seem as though, you know, resistance is a very easy thing for enslaved people. We have to always remember that enslaved people are resisting, um, but they're resisting uh, their autonomy being uh, stripped away from them, right? So we can't talk about resistance without talking about the violence of slavery. Uh, to my left, what you see is um, an amulet. And we know that uh, a large segment of the uh, enslaved people who were once held on our site were most likely from West Africa via the West Indies, uh, Antigua to be more specific. And these amulets were used as a source of protection. And they also represent uh, native uh, religious practices that enslaved people maintained despite 
uh, their enslavement and despite being um, introduced to different religions such as Christianity. And so these artifacts are part of the way in which we tell the story of enslaved people on our site. And we have other artifacts that were uncovered such as like the milk pans that I showed you earlier and the, um, the slave quarters um, in, the, in this, I'm sorry, in the winter kitchen. And we know that a bunch of those milk pans and uh, cream pots were actually found uh, directly uh, near the slave quarters. And so a part of how we have interpreted the site is that while the slave quarters were also used for sleeping spaces, enslaved women, men, and children also work there. And so we um, believe that the slave quarters doubled as a dairy um, and also um, a space in which uh, different forms of labor were happening, such as washing and ironing, um, in addition to just being sleeping quarters for enslaved people. So another uh, artifact that I want to talk about um, in general, which as a historian, um, we think about um, a lot about archival records, right? And uh, although it's not um, an artifact in the traditional sense, one of the things that we have from the 18th century, which is really special, is a petition from Belinda Sutton, which was launched in 1783. Now, I mentioned that Isaac Royal Jr. Um, was, uh, well, Isaac Royal Jr. inherited the uh, site from his father, Isaac Royal Sr., um, after his father passed away, and he became the most well known of the royal family because as I mentioned he was a part of the governor's council he amassed a ton of property throughout Massachusetts um, and he you know he was a businessman he owned taverns and um, different different businesses and so when he passed away in 1781 uh, in his will there was a woman, Belinda, who he gave the option uh, to either be enslaved by his daughter or to gain her freedom. Of course, Belinda Sutton chooses her freedom. And in 1783, uh, she launches a petition for a pension from the royal estate in which she asks um, to be compensated for the labor uh, that was a that was compelled from her for the benefit of the royal family in which she never ever received any payment for. So I'm just gonna read a portion of um, the 1783 petition because it is unlike um, many documents um, petitions that are launched in the 18th century. Usually those petitions are freedom petitions, but this document is actually advocating for um, a fi financial compensation. So many scholars have called this actually one of the first uh, instances of reparations that we have in this country. So the petition of Belinda, an African, humbly shows that 70 years have rolled away since she on the banks of the Rio de Volta received her existence. She was ravished from the bosom of her country from the arms of her friends, while the advanced age of her parents, rendering them unfit for servitude, cruelly separated her from them forever. She learned to catch the ideas marked by the sounds of language, only to know that her doom was slavery, from which death alone was to emancipate her. And though she was a free moral agent accountable for her actions, she never had a moment at her own disposal. 50 years her faithful hands have been compelled to ignoble servitude for the benefit of an Isaac Royal, while she by the laws of the land is denied the enjoyment of one morsel of that immense wealth, a part whereof hath been accumulated by her own industry and the whole augmented by her servitude. She prays that such an allowance be made out to her from the estate of Colonel Royal, as will prevent her and her more infirm daughter from misery, and she will ever pray. So at the time of the petition, Belinda was living in Boston, and we know that she was illiterate because she signs the petition with an X indicating um, that she couldn't uh, read or write. And we believe that the initial petition was drafted by Prince Hall, who was a prominent leader of Boston's free black community in the 18th century. So what's, what's really remarkable about this petition is that uh, she actually won. She was awarded annual pay payments of about 15 pounds and 12 shilling shillings. However, after the first payment, she um, 
had to go back to court five more times over the course of a decade in order to um, receive payment because the payments were regularly missed. And she petitioned up until uh, the 1790s when she um, passed away. And so we know that she was never able to receive all of the money that was owed to her, yet she continuously petitioned um, Massachusetts. And a part of this is for us to think about what does it mean to leave a record behind? And how do we talk about how enslaved people left records behind? And we can do that through the actual artifacts that are left behind, as well as um, historical documents and archival documents, such as Belinda's petition, that really forces us to think about um, how enslaved people negotiated and negotiated enslavement as well as advocating uh, for slavery, uh, advocating for the end uh, of legalized slavery in Massachusetts. And I want to end by saying that Belinda launches her petition in uh, 1783. And two months after she submits her uh, petition, Matt, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court um, actually abolishes legalized slavery. And now we know that slavery continues in many ways, but it's really important to think about um, Belinda and a community of Black abolitionists who were defining freedom on their own terms. And I think when we think about resistance, you have uh, petitions such as this one, but you also have the everyday acts of resistance um, that I talked about earlier in terms of stilling moments for leisure uh, through examining um, the tiles that were turned into game pieces that were left behind um, as archaeological evidence. So I'm going to um, end here, and I will gladly uh, take any questions you all may have. Um, yes, yeah, so please send in any questions to uh, the chat function. Um, already a few. Um, so uh, in New England, there is the dominant narrative when slavery is even acknowledged of having happened here, that it wasn't as bad as Southern um, slavery. And can you talk more about how wrong that assumption is? Yeah, so when people say that it wasn't bad um, as Southern slavery, it's important to uh, kind of uh, push back against that because uh, slavery is, um, you know, inhumane, it is immoral, um, that there, if, if people assume that slavery was uh, more benevolent in the North, then there's a, an assumption that enslavers uh, treated enslaved people well. And we have to remember that uh, slavery is about the theft of labor, right? And that uh, racial uh, stereotypes are used to justify the theft of labor. So when we think about this country's wealth, we have to acknowledge that it is built upon uh, the slave trade and that it is the the trying to strip people of their humanity in order to build one's wealth and so slavery as an institution is just terrible you know uh there's no way around it there's no such thing as a benevolent um enslaver there's no such thing as a um as a good form of slavery there's there's just no such thing because we're talking about human beings who were forced into um, an unnatural uh, condition. And so, yeah, I, I, you know, I think that that myth is pervasive because we don't have in New England, you know, generally large scale plantations. Uh, the Royal House and Slave Quarters is an exception. Um, but in general, most enslaved people um, lived in uh, homes that had maybe three or four other enslaved people. And so I think people think that, you know, it was a nicer arrangement, but no, there's no, there's nothing, you know, good about slavery. You can't choose where you live. You can't choose what you wear. You can't choose what you eat. You can't choose um, to get married. You're forced to be illiterate. You, you, you have no control, you know, yeah. um, in general over your legal personhood. So, uh, it's, it's just, it's just, it's a terrible formulation um, yes. in so many ways. Um, so another question is, um, 
for the archaeological material, how do people go about uh, accessing them or seeing them? Where are they located? Yeah, so if you come on our site, we have um, some of that material actually is housed at our site in the slave quarters. And so if you come, if you were to come and visit, you would go into the slave quarters and you would see um, two cases of uh, artifacts that really tell the story of um, bounty and uh, bondage, bondage. So that what you would see is that you would see um, uh, fancy wine bottles that have the royal family's uh, seal stamped onto them. And then in another case, you would see the artifacts that help us tell um, the stories and uh, the stories of enslaved people. And you see kind of the milk pans or you would see the game pieces and the tiles. So most of them are, not most of them, a lot of them um, are on display at our site. Um, there are some that are at Boston University and then the rest is controlled by the state of Massachusetts. Okay. Um, another question is in terms of other organizations uh, in the area, um, kind of going back to very similar to the other one in terms of New England likes to ignore our history of slavery, how are other how are you seeing other organizations who might not have archaeological collections that directly speak to it how are they talking about slavery or changing how they talk or things like that well i think what i've started to see um is that there are a lot of sites who are now starting to explore their connections to um slavery and people are starting um, to do research on their sites. So a lot of people are at the very beginning of um, this work. Some people have been doing it for a while, but I think a lot of people are just launching research projects, just get into the archives to see what's there. Um, what are there documents that talk about slavery in relation to their site? And most likely when you start to dig around in the archive, you're gonna find it. And so I think even if you do not have um, you know, archaeology that can help tell the story of slavery. I think before we even got to the archaeological aspect, we started to do the research um, to unearth that there was slavery on the site, which then prompted um, an archaeological uh, dig. Okay. Um, we have another question. Um, was the kitchen part of the main house or a separate building as at Washington's Mount Vernon plantation? Yeah, so there are actually two kitchens. The one that I showed you is the winter kitchen, winter kitchen, and that is a part of the main house. And enslaved people would have mo mostly used that um, space uh, during the colder months. And the slave quarters, attached to the slave quarters, actually is um, a summer kitchen, and that would have been used in the hotter months. Is that but the brick side? Yeah, that's the brick side of the slave quarters. And what's really, really um, important about that is that uh, the the kitchen, the two kitchens, actually the distance between the slave quarters and the main house is about 35 feet away. Okay. Um, well, those were the questions we had. Um, thank you, uh, Kira. Dr. Singleton, I'm gonna call you that. Um, <laughs> So for everyone else, thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you at our next lecture, which is on Wednesday, May 19th, when we are joined by Dr. Kelly Britt, uh, who will be speaking about archaeology and activism. And again, we rely on the support of viewers like you. So consider supporting our outreach by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. And also consider becoming a member of the Royal House and Slave Quarters Museum because we all need our support, especially right now during COVID. Um, and uh, are you guys open yet for tours or anything like that? We are not open yet for tours. We're hoping to open uh, later in the summer. Um, so you should all look out for an announcement um, sometime in June about when we'll be reopening. But you can stay up to date with us by going to our website at royalhouse.org. Uh, um, and you'll be able to subscribe to our newsletter and find out uh, all of the information there. And you can also become members. So yes. And their newsletters are really good. They just sent one out today, so, um, and everything. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Singleton, again. Um, so everyone, have a good Wednesday. Thank you. Bye.